Good evening, everybody. You're in for a treat tonight. We have um, a locally grown islander who's going to give a talk on um, the underwater world around Vashon. And um, this is in partnership with the Vashon Center for the Arts. Um, this is our second year helping with the Talks on the Rock and co-creating a couple of the talks in the series. We have three this year, James Hyde's talk tonight, and then we have two more coming up in the spring, one on kelp and one on global climate change and um, musical compositions that, um, by Judy Twett. Um, that describe climate change graphs. So that should be pretty cool um, as well. So tonight we get to listen to James Hyde, who was born in Seattle, grew up here on Vashon Island. So many of you probably know him. Um, James has a passion for the underwater world that I'm sure that you will love experiencing tonight. He um, is good at underwater photography and videography. He is a naturalist guide for Lindblad. Um, expeditions and has been since 2016 and that's National Geographic expeditions um, all over the world and so that's pretty exciting maybe some of that will end up in this talk as well um, and he just loves talking about nature and um, the underwater world and he's a great storyteller so uh, welcome James thanks for joining us tonight Hi everyone. Oh, come on. Yeah, thank you. All right, get myself set up so I can roam around to keep track of me. Thank you all. So we live on an island, and as much as we pay for it in the consequences of Washington State ferries and other um, inconveniences, it's a really beautiful place. I like to tell everybody um, when I try to communicate it to those I meet out in the great wide ocean sailing around with Lindblad Expeditions um, that some of my favorite things about being here are feeling like you're four hours away from the city, but you're really only one, depending on how the ferries go. Um, and the other part of that, you know, being girt by sea, if you will, um, is we are hugged and encompassed by a really beautiful, unusual ecosystem with lots of strange, colorful, and enchanting creatures that I know are down there, and I'm here to tell you are down there, living their poetic and violent existences um, right off our shores. I'm not going to talk about whales or salmon. Um, I'm not going to talk about the um, issues relating to those creatures or porpoises or sea lions or anything like that. There are, even in this room, uh, many people who can speak much better than me and more authoritatively than me on those subjects. I want to show you um, sort of some of the unsung heroes the small, the weird, the frightening, um, and answer the question about what is just lurking down there. So again, things we love about living here, being here, visiting, um, are the beautiful coastlines, uh, the little freshwater deltas, and what makes our island so spectacular um, is all about the geography of where it is, right? It's a, we are living on glacial moraines. Uh, those are the gravel and sand that was pushed up by glaciers in the recent glacial maximum, making all of these little islets. We've you know, sort of changed them ourselves a little bit, built a portage, land bridge, and changed things a little bit. But largely, um, this intricate coastline and this deluge of rain that we get most of the time um, is what leads to having a really productive, beautiful green ocean, as well as hills. It's a really special place. Um, I'm sure you all are very well aware, but it's that fresh water introduction that keeps our plants green, keeps our oceans green, 
It keeps things productive. Washing minerals, that's fertilizer, right, um, into our oceans uh, from the land. That's a little bit about the context of where we are. Now, thank you for the introduction, Bianca. Um, who am I? I was born in Seattle, and I think spent a great long time living in Queen Anne, about three months or so, uh, before coming to the island. I was part of the first class of kindergartners that went to Chautauqua Elementary and went all the way through. Didn't go all the way through. I spent three wonderful years at the Harbor School, um, one of our very fine uh, institutions on the island. Went to uh, Vashon High School, then Western Washington University. There I studied uh, environmental education, which is a sub-group, uh, sub-discipline of environmental studies. Learned to dive out of a passion for being outside, interned at dive shops, and had a really great introduction from um, a dear childhood friend to work for Lindblad Expeditions, and I get to go all over the world uh, exploring the underwater world. And that is an incredibly boring history of me. And that's not what you came here for. We came for the underwater oddities. And I would like to spend quite a bit of time introducing you to the natural history of the odd things that live underwater. And the oddest thing of all Underwater oddity number one, that's Nick. <laughs> that's not, not me, that's Nick, he's right here. Um, that's my brother. <laughs> Sorry, Brew. Um, now you get the spirit of how this is gonna go. So, a little bit of a better history. Uh, that's me, sort of treading water highly because uh, I don't really want it to touch me all that much, if I can. Never really liked it all that much. Um, <clears throat> I see a lot of people who take to the water in KVI in the summer doing this. I don't know how they're swimming with their belly buttons exposed, but they just really don't want to be in the water. It's cold, there's things down there. If you ever touch something with your foot underwater, it's a horrifying experience. Um, never really liked it that much. It was cold and kind of frightening but really interesting. And my brother learned to dive um, m long before I did. And just as I finish this introduction about what brought me here to talk to you, the theme is going to be really small suggestions, actions, interactions, uh, can create a really big effect in people's lives, young people, impressionable people's lives. Um, so my brother telling me a little bit about how interesting the underwater world is um, sort of set that in motion, but it took a long time to gel. So wandering through university, drifting like a plankton, if you will, um, I ended up taking a year off, much to my, uh, I'm sure, parents' um, nervous you know, foot rocking, well, okay, you're gonna go back, right? Did. I uh, went and lived in Australia for a year, because that's what you do when you're having one of many quarter life crises. Uh, and you can't go without going to the Great Barrier Reef. And just these things lining up, I went snorkeling and thought it was the most magical thing I'd ever seen. An episode of planet Earth unfolding before your very eyes. And why I came to realize. When we walk through the woods or terrestrial ecosystem, we are a part of the ecology, right? We are predators. And as we move through the forest, the deer hunker down and we don't see them, and the birds go quiet, and you have to spend a lot of time sitting in place and blending in to really get an appreciation for how much of a rippling effect a human has in a terrestrial ecosystem. But in a marine ecosystem, largely, you can float through undisturbed and watch the comings and goings of animals 
living out their violent and colorful existences. And it all happens before your very eyes. It's an incredible thing. And I had to find out what that was like. I had to have more of being um, an absolute ghost of an observer floating through an ecosystem where things just play out on their own. You don't disturb things. It's like if you've ever uh, worn camouflage and sat in the woods for a long time, eventually it lights up around you. I encourage this. And I finally was able to manage to answer the question, and I'm here to tell you that when you're treading water really high, you don't really want to know like what's down there, what's lurking going to stroke your foot. The answer is a lot of fascinating, beautiful, strange creatures that are totally uninterested in you, mostly. I found that to be a massive comfort. And I'd like to introduce you to some of them, some of my favorite creatures that lurk on the bottom with no interest in you whatsoever. Ah, these are the momraths. No, they're not the momraths. Those are the momraths <laughs> from Alice in Wonderland. Um, but you can see the family resemblance, I suppose. So you're looking at plumose anemones. These you will find all around our island. They're in silent chorus just out of view now, out there. And these creatures, you can kind of imagine them. They have that long stalk. They're standing straight up, if you will. Their feet are on um, a hard substrate, rock, a sunken log, a piling. And you can imagine their straight bodies. Their digestive tract is in their tube. And then all here is a bunch of arms out in radial uh, symmetry, a beautiful chorus to just pull food in and stuff their face all day long. They love it. They go a step further um, in that in order to harness food that may be swimming by and would otherwise evade them, they have small stinging cells. These are called pneumatocysts. Um, and it's like a coiled up harpoon of a cell inside. And with a little bit of venom, as long as they are both physically and chemically disturbed. So if like, you know, a stick blows into them underwater or a leaf or a piece of algae, they don't go shooting off their cells. They have to be chemically as well as physically disturbed. Boom! Out comes the harpoon. They sting, anesthetize, immobilize their prey, and work it towards their oral disc. That's a one way in and a one way out for their prey. You can kind of think of them like jellies, and they have an interesting interaction, and they're closely related to jellyfish. Um, I try not to say jellyfish. They're not fish. They don't even look like fish. It confuses no one, but it's something that guides sort of uh, get caught up in, like starfish. Nobody considers it a fish, but we poo-poo when people say, oh, it's not a starfish. So all that aside, um, if you can imagine an anemone stuck on the bottom, its t tentacles and its mouth up like this. The jellies are just this. They're, instead of a polyp version, they're a medusa version. They kind of go blorbing along, looking for somebody's leg to sting, um, and casting their tentacles out wide. And the big difference in this image, um, you'll see these two interacting. We can't be stung by plumose anemones. You can touch them. Please do, gently, if you see them. It's an interesting experience. Um, but if you happen to see a lion's mane jelly, whether it's washed up on the beach or not, don't touch it. Those nematocysts are quite a bit larger. They are quite a bit stronger. And you will regret it. Um, it usually takes the curious two times to really learn that. However, despite its larger nematocysts, more firepower, if you will, the lion's mane jelly, which, by the way, can be the longest animal on Earth, it's not the blue whale, 
but their tentacles can reach over 130 feet and they can grow to diameters of six feet across the bell. This is in Antarctica, not around here. And they grow very old. However, when they encounter their near cousins, the plumose anemones, they are no match because the anemones are sessile and they've sucked onto the bottom. And this, what you're looking at, is a sting off and the jelly is losing. Slowly it will be pulled into the mouth openings and ripped asunder by all of these different anemones. And that will be a very dead jelly. You can imagine that living amongst the Metridium plumos anemones is a, you know, kind of a scary place to be. Ah, if you coat yourself in armor, not to worry. Again, they can't sting us, they can't sting fish, but they can sting lots of predators um, with soft bodies. So a big colonized pier, for example, covered in plumos and anemones, is a great habitat for lots of animals that are immune to the sting. You can think of this like uh, Nemo's home, right? The clownfish that live in anemones. We have a, a similar kind of thing with a certain species of shrimp here and a different anemone. But a, an ecosystem entirely covered in these anemones um, is a, a very safe place to be if you happen to be swimming around and immune to their stings. Giant plumose anemones covered all hard surfaces. These animals have a hard time growing in sand or silt, but given a rock or a sunken log, they will absolutely colonize. The anemones wait for the water to bring them food, but lurking around their base, an ambush predator waits. This is a benthic fish, a sculpin. They spend most of their time on the bottom, using their camouflage to hide from predators like sea lions and ambush smaller, unwary prey. Let's talk about some fish a little bit, because they are very happy to live in and amongst these anemones. <clears throat> the sculpin I showed you, that's an ambush predator lie in wait. They don't have a swim bladder. They can't swim pelagically like salmon, for example. Um, there are other fish that do have them, like this brown rockfish. Uh, they can swim, but they prefer just to be around substrate rocks, rockfish, if you will. Um, they are our reef fish. Uh, Nemo and Dory, the tangs and clownfish of the tropical ecosystems that you've seen, I'm sure, too many times with your kids. Um, we don't have those. <laughs> but we have reefs, and we have reef fish. And the rockfish um, are our perfect example. <clears throat> they have spines on their dorsal fin. Um, they can wedge themselves into cracks if they need to get away from something. But they're bold, um, and they're comfortable in their rocky reef ecosystem. Uh, really interesting creatures. Again, they're not afraid of divers. They're a little wary. They'll put their spines up and turn sideways and let you know, hey, watch out. But they'll let you get right up close to them. I was obviously very close to this animal. They just have the most beautiful eye and their sense organs right here. They afford some excellent looks and really cool interactions as well. They'll sort of uh, show you where their nest is um, by kind of guarding it. Like, ah, I can see what's going on here. Now, I said I wasn't going to talk about salmon or whales or anything. Um, we also have certain kinds of species of sharks, for example, uh, spiny dogfish and the great six-gill sharks that are huge and live very deep and sometimes come up. But I am excited to talk about this creature, and it's related to sharks. Um, in fact, the chimera is the bridge between bony fish fish as we know them, and cartilaginous fish. Those are the rays and sharks, elasmobranchs, if you will. And the chimeras are these funny creatures. Uh, meet Hydrolagus coli. Anybody know the common name? 
Radfish. I know. It's kind of a bummer of a name, isn't it? Yeah. Sorry, guy. Um, this is a girl, actually. You can see uh, they get their name from the sort of a long rat-like tail. They don't use that tail very much for propulsion. They can't really, because there's not a whole heck of a lot of it. But they've got these big, beautiful pectoral fins. That's what they use. Um, you can see out from a top view, they're really outsized, kind of. Um, it's very rare to see fish uh, with such huge pectoral fins. They're fins, not flippers, by the way. Flippers have bones in them. So whales have flippers um, and flukes. And fish, generally, um, have fins with rays in them. Uh, but it, these fish have no bones either. Uh, they are all cartilaginous. They don't have scales. Uh, they have sort of a soft, leathery um, outside on them. They kind of have these funny, like, stitched together marks. They sort of look like kind of a horrifying, sewn together doll that maybe haunts your dreams a little bit. I think they're really cute. Um, this big green eyes. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> yeah. Don't listen to them. Uh, this is a male, and sexual dimorphism is when two sexes, uh, or the two sexes of a species, look differently. Um, for example, mallards, mallard ducks, right? You can tell the male and the female very easily. That is sexual dimorphism. It's not expressed very commonly in fish, but um, in certain species it is, and with this one, um, you can kind of tell, actually, most sharks and rays. There's a couple of key giveaways. Check this out. This little white thing on its forehead, that's called the cephalic clasper. And this you should be really excited about. <laughs> <coughs> I'll sell it, I promise. Um, <coughs> the males are quite a bit smaller than the females. And um, they breed sexually. And so in order for the males to kind of get in position, and this happens with most sharks, they have little claspers on their pelvic, uh, next to their pelvic fins. That helps them. But these animals, the cephalic clasper, um, instead of biting the female, which some sharks do, they have this thing on their head. It kind of opens. Oh, hello. It opens a little bit. Um, and they can hold on to the female's dorsal fin um, and kind of work themselves into position that way. The females are, again, quite a lot larger. And the reason this is so cool, they have this weird appendage on their forehead for holding on the female's fins, which is really weird. Um, it's expressed in no other vertebrate. No uh, mammal, no bird, no other fish, no shark, no monkey, no nothing. It's the only vertebrate where you can find one of these. It's super cool. And there's a bunch of them swimming out there right now. <laughs> I don't know if that's comforting or not. <clears throat> Again, they're not at all interested in us, in me, in you, um, except sometimes they'll grab the bait off your uh, line. If you bring up one up, take a look at it, enjoy its presence. You are holding uh, the bridge between sharks and fish. Again, this is our male friend. His other claspers are back here, past the pelvic fin, and those he uses to hang on to the female um, and do the deed, if you will. I mean, they're kind of cute, right? <laughs> is it working? No? <laughs> no, OK. Um, again, and if you do pull one up, I find them very interesting. Have a, have a gander. Put it back in the water gently, please. Um, mind the spine on top of their dorsal fin. There is a quite venomous spine just in front of the dorsal fin. It blends right in, uh, but it's a different thing. It has um, not particularly toxic venom to us, but it will give you a nasty infection, and it will smoke for a couple of days. Uh, just watch out for it. Mostly it's used in defense against Harbor seals, for example, uh, that would like to take a bite out of it. They don't have teeth. 
Um, instead, they have kind of grinding plates. Very strong jaw, but they're just sort of plates. Um, so it's sort of hard for them to defend themselves. Now, let's talk about some other horrifying animals. <laughs> what is it? Moon snail. Who's got one in their bathroom? <laughs> yeah, I thought you might. Yeah, the shell is really beautiful. A huge, huge shell. This is an enormous creature. Many, many pounds. Um, and you can see when they're fully expressed underwater and really living their best lives and strutting their stuff. It's can, like there's no way it's going to retract into its shell, right? It just it doesn't even need to. Um, it is such a bad bruiser of a snail, it ain't afraid of nobody, right? <laughs> this snail cruises along um, around in the mud. Has anyone found those collars on the beach made of sand and, and mucus? That's the egg casings of these creatures. They're really, really small eggs. I promise that they're in there, um, in, in that collar. And sometime as they mature, the eggs will hatch, and the little larva moon snails will swim off and join the plankton community, where they will slowly get larger and then drop to the seafloor and become the giant bad MFs that they are. Um, they'll eat each other. They will eat pretty much anything with a snail, with a shell of the snails, clams. They'll even take crabs if they can get a hold of them. And the way they dispatch them, who's found a shell with a hole drilled right in it. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> Jude was out there with a drill, uh, you know, in the morning, like drilling out all of these for you. Uh, thanks for that. No, that's from the moon snail. And what they do is they lick that hole into the clam in order to get the juices out. How do they do it? With a lot of power. And they have um, one of the most horrifying appendage adaptations that I can think of called a radula. And this is a diamond-tipped tongue that can bore a hole into a shell. And if you find it with a little countersunk, that's what they've done. Then they insert their proboscis, and in a flurry of digestive juices, dispatch their victims. Horrifying. <laughs> Just horrifying. Again, I said violent existences. Now the moon jelly, right? Some of you have seen the video I made on this. I'll show you a clip from that. These are beautiful creatures. We get a huge number of them in Quartermaster Harbor every year. That's a sign of nutrient pollution, by the way. Um, it doesn't flush out particularly well. Lots of nutrients are stuck inside. Big bloom of algae, big bloom of things um, all the way up the food chain. So we get this huge congregation of moon jellies. Does anybody know the collective noun of, a moon, of moon jellies? Wow. And not a jam, but nice. Thanks, Grant. <laughs> <laughs> a jelly, no. Uh, yeah, not a peanut butter either. It's called a smack. A smack. Yeah, really. The edge of their bell, that is where the action is. Hundreds of tiny tentacles line the fringe with hundreds of pneumatocyst stinging cells each. They can't penetrate human skin, but for small prey, they are quite deadly. Polychaete worms are darting by, feeding themselves on small plankton. But in a flash, the swimming worm becomes a victim of the moon jelly. Paralysis quickly sets in as the venom penetrates into the worm. Soon, the polychaete will be passed to the frills that make up the jelly's mouth and digestive tract to be liquefied and wrung of its energy. With little more than a nerve net for a brain, it's difficult to say whether this jelly even knows that it's made a kill, but a kill it has made. And yet its rhythmic, pulsing hunting continues into the night. In 
and what seems to be a streak of luck for this jellyfish, a second worm beelines into its tentacles. This one is less easily subdued, and thrashing about, it rips the jelly's own tentacles away from its body, making what seems to be a daring escape. But the attached stingers have done their job already, and the polychae worm falls motionless and sinks into the black. I've never been accused of having a flair for the dramatic. <clears throat> now what you really all came here for, mm, mm. Um, to answer your burning question, yes, I have seen my octopus teacher. <laughs> okay, I've seen it, thank you. Um, it's a magical film and if you haven't seen it, of course, please do. Um, you will find that they wiggle and worm their squishy way into your heart um, more than uh, you ever thought possible. It's a beautiful film. Um, did you know that the largest species of octopus lives out there? Yeah. What's it called? The giant Pacific, exactly. This is not one. Uh, Sorry, <clears throat> this is a little red octopus. This was um, cruising right, where did I find this one? Um, just uh, Redondo Beach on the other side from Manzanita towards Burien. Um, little reds um, are perfectly respectable in terms of size. This one was flexing on its neighbor. There was another octopus nearby and it was showing that this was its rock menagerie. Um, they do this territorial display. The giant Pacific octopus um, are nocturnal. They come out and they hunt at night. You still may find them. They are crawling all around us right now. They have dens and they spend most of the time um, during the day holed up in their den um, and you can find them pretty easily underwater because you will find uh, the bones of their victims just scattered all out their front door. It's really macabre. It's very, very cool. Um, and it's sort of sobering when um, sort of interacting with one underwater, looking into its cave, and it's looking back at you, and it sort of is tracking. And uh, you realize that the, not even the largest of all, um, but a very... Uh, large standard adult can weigh 100 pounds. And from arm tip to arm tip, their wingspan, what do you think? 20 feet. No, the giant Pacific octopus. The giant Pacific is the largest one, 20 foot wingspan, incredibly strong, all muscle, no bone, one sharp beak. Fascinating creatures. They have. Um, a little bit of their brain in every single arm. They have green blood. They have three hearts. They um, can change their skin color and texture. They can see way broad into the ultra, into beyond our spectrum. Uh, they can taste with their tentacles. They have venom. They have a beak. They have one of those radulas. They are the most alien frickin' creature you can possibly imagine. And there is an army out there <laughs> surrounding us. Camouflage is an incredibly important adaptation in the animal kingdom, and especially so in the shallow seas. The grand master of camouflage was lurking along Dalco Wall and almost evaded our detection. At the last moment, we realized that nestled amongst the rocks and algae was none other than the octopus. The ability to change the color and texture of their skin at a moment's notice and to squeeze their soft bodies into impossibly strange shapes and small locations makes the octopus a devilishly difficult animal to locate if it doesn't want to be found.
goes invisible. Octopus are incredibly intelligent animals, and most divers have a keen fondness for them. Paul and I are no exceptions, but the air in our tanks was running low, and with the surface still 80 feet above us, we had to begin our ascent. Utterly fascinating creatures. So strange. Um, now, soft-bodied, colorful, unusual, frightening, venomous, all terms we could also apply uh, to a very small creature and one of my favorites. I have to give a little bit of a nod before I talk about the nudibranchs um, to the background of this image, and that's um, the seagrass. Seagrass beds are um, a big part of the ecosystem that surrounds Vashon. Um, the eelgrass, it is actually a flowering plant. There's very few of those that live in the ocean. Most of the things that grow and use sunlight are algaes, which are protists, not plants. Um, but this is actually a flowering plant, and it's really important habitat, uh, mostly for bait fish that swarm in huge aggregations that come and lay their eggs on the eelgrass. That serves as a substrate um, so they don't get blown away in the breeze, right? Current can be quite strong. And uh, if you sink into the black as a little tiny egg, uh, you don't stand much of a chance. But having uh, some substance anchored into the sand uh, really juices the productivity of a particular ecosystem. So this shallow, muddy substrate that is sometimes not really great for diving is really important because it is the breeding grounds of small fish, bait fish, that feed um, all the way up the food chain to our salmon and our killer whales. Wonderful stuff. Living in it is a, a whole number of interesting creatures. It's kind of like the prairie out there. And cruising along um, up and down the blades, sometimes in big blooms, sometimes not, are these little monsters. Nudibranchs are fascinating creatures. They are um, a snail that has, well, as a slug, evolved into a snail, which is really quite a trick, right? Because you have to fold your body in half to get it into the shell, right? Because you can't have your internal organs dumping things out the backside when it's in a shell. So that's called torsion. They've evolved into a shell. Then they've evolved back out again. They've given up their armor. You would think that it would be advantageous to have a shell. Many creatures do. They've surrendered it uh, for a different strategy. They're beautiful little creatures. Uh, they're all over the ocean of, from the tropics to the polar regions, I've seen them everywhere. And they're expressed um, in these incredible variety of colors. And if you uh, ever <laughs> have way too much time on your hands, which I'm sure you all do, then uh, you can find a hilarious little corner of the internet where some genius has uh, contrasted nudibranch um, appearance with costumes from David Bowie. <laughs> it's amazing. The man knew, we knew all along that Bowie was a creature from inner space as well as outer space. Beautiful um, sizes, textures, colors. This is a frosted nudibranch on the wreck of the Anna Foss, which is a tugboat. There's not a lot left of it uh, sitting just off Christensen Cove. If you go to Liza Vula Park, and look south, you're looking right at it. We float over the reef looking for beautiful things. And every once in a while, we are rewarded with views of the jeweled animals of the ocean. Nudibranchs. A snail that has given up its shell in favor of a flamboyant appearance, advertising its toxicity and stinging ability. 
unable to generate the stingers of its own accord, many nudibranchs actually consume other stinging animals and use their venomous cells for the nudibranchs' own defense. How about that? They can't make the stingers themselves. Those nematocysts that I aforementioned um, that occur in uh, jellies as well as um, their polyp version, the um, anemones, and even down to even smaller versions. <clears throat> the nudibranch can eat them, not trigger them, pass it through its digestive tract into those feathery appendages called serrata, and there the weapons wait. Yeah, sweet, totally sweet. Now, <clears throat> more recently, um, in fact, just a couple of days ago, uh, Trinity, my sweetheart, and I went out for a little paddle at night, which is a hilarious thing to do. Um, but if you bring along a bunch of lights and a little underwater robot, you just don't know what you might find. So, shining light from above and a multitude of piling perch and pipefish were our constant companions. And here we are getting ready. We're out at the standard oil docks. Um, I'm bravely looking right into the lights because that's what intelligent marine biologists do. And built in 1921 by the Standard Oil Corporation, you're, I'm sure, all familiar with the docks out there. They've been closed for years. Um, they're covered in toxic creosote, but underwater, they're also covered in life. And I know a fair amount of these creatures. I've been diving around these pilings as long as I've been diving. Nick and I have gone there many times. But every, the scenery is always changing. And um, Trinity found this giant ogre star. Uh, they can come in a variety of colors as well. Here's a purple one. And no worries about that little sculpin scurrying under it. It's just trying to get away from uh, the ROV itself. There's lights on it. It's outside if you want to see it later. Um, sea stars are recovering, I'm happy to say. Uh, sea star wasting disease has um, hit them really hard. Uh, it has been traced most recently, I've heard, to a bacteria. It was a bacteria, then a virus, and a bacteria again. And it coats the outside of their bodies in the slime that prevents them uh, from breathing dissolved oxygen, which is what they have to breathe. So that's why they were dying. We found a bunch of pipefish, as I said. These are very shy fish. They don't like divers at all. They're a big exception to that rule that I talked about. When you float through an ecosystem underwater, and you don't disturb much. Sometimes those bubbles scare away certain species, and the pipefish is one of them. I'm really happy to see them. Uh, they're pretty much like a seahorse if you straighten it out. That's a way to think of them. Seahorse or fish, remember? Um, sometimes you get yourself in a <laughs> bit of a jam, uh, especially running an ROV around. I know um, there's one right here. Thanks. You probably have uh, experienced that. You got to be a little bit careful because they don't work wirelessly. Um, so careful unthreading of knots underwater is something that ROV uh, pilots tend to specialize in. So we cruised around, and we found some toilets. <laughs> That's exciting underwater oddity, right? Uh, this is a great tradition. Maybe you don't know about this. <laughs> um, but uh, for many years, derelict toilets, um, commodes of all sorts, were thrown off the end of the pier there. Uh, I regret that I never got to do one, much to my parents' delight, I'm sure. Uh, but I certainly would. Divers are usually the ones that stand them upright, I got to say. Uh, they make for hilarious pictures when you're sitting there underwater. <laughs> There's quite a few of them. Um, and they serve, actually, as an interesting addition to the habitat down there. They're a hard surface. That porcelain is pretty tough. Um, so things like to colonize around it. If you can hide behind something underwater, you're doing all right. So somewhere to hide, something to grow on, then we'll get blown away in the current. And uh, it tends to be a pretty attractive place to be. So you'll find all, all kinds of commode fish around. Uh, 
right in the center of the screen, that's a big shrimp back there. Um, and some more of the pipefish. The encrusting things you see there are scars of barnacles that have broken off, those little rings. And there's limpets, of course, as well. Lots of really unusual things. Um, I do confess we were out there looking for squid. It's a little too late in the season for that. Now, um, I want to talk about a few other creatures. And I'm going to show you some footage with the disclaimer that all of these creatures live around us. But this stuff was mostly shot in British Columbia and Southeast Alaska. The range of many of these creatures um, is quite broad. And it extends down to here. It's not dishonest. They're here. I just didn't shoot them here. Everything else you've seen until now has all been shot right offshore of Vashon. So what you're looking at here um, is a pteropod. This is a sea angel. And they're really horrifying creatures. Members of the plankton community. Tina 4, that's a comb jelly. It's not making that light. It's actually just reflecting it or refracting it, as it were. Here's a couple of species of rockfish. You can see um, one of them's got the spines right up. It's showing me who's boss. Who knows what that is? It's a lingcod. Yep, absolutely. Don't make one mad. They're very territorial. Big, huge mounds. They tend to let you get pretty close, um, but they'd always keep a watchful eye. The males will guard their nest, and if you get too close to one in uh, nesting season and you get close to its eggs, you will find yourself with an arm full of teeth, big teeth, as it were. Um, very large fish. I remember the largest I saw was on Susha Island um, up in the you know, northern reaches of the sound. That's a giant nudibranch. It's called a giant nudibranch. Um, it's about the size of a football, if you can imagine that. Most of the other ones I showed you from around Vashon are about that big. And the sea pen, um, if you've followed uh, my YouTube videos, there's a bunch of these under the North End Ferry Dock, like a lot of them. Um, they are colonial Nidaria. They're related to anemones, actually. Check it out. There's a bunch of tiny anemones all building this structure together. What you're looking at is a condo. It's not a single animal. It is many, many animals that are building this structure together. How about that? Um, sort of like a coral, for example. Um, but these are, yeah, sort of a soft structure, not a stony coral. This um, is a basket star. And it has its arms out, waiting for something to swim by, and it will curl in and grab a hold. See, there's kind of little Fibonacci curls. That's what they do. They just kind of wait in the breeze um, for something to come by where they snag it. Small disc in the center. That's their main body. And many, many branching arms is how this animal uh, makes its way in the water. Fascinating creatures. Um, you'll often find them in the company of uh, highly decorated crabs that are just actively camouflaging themselves, even with chunks of... Um, uh, fecal matter. <laughs> so this is a feather star. Another star, these are uh, all related. These are all echinoderms uh, related to sea stars. This one just has these feathery appendages, and it's doing sort of a similar thing, waiting for something to come by, and it will snag it. With all of this different surface area, and in high um, magnification, you can see that there's little hooks, and it will hook whatever it finds in the water and bring it down to its mouth which is just about here. There's a little brittle star underneath, right there, another echinoderm. They move themselves around, and the feather stars can swim. How's that for haunting your dreams, right? Uh, pentaradial symmetry, that's five-sided symmetry. They can have five, 10, 15 arms. Um, and when they get disturbed, they can abandon their post and go swimming along like this. It's really horrifying to see underwater if you're not expecting it. Um, it's not really. It's really quite delightful. And then they sort of upright themselves and set back down. Tunicates are filter feeders. They pump water in one siphon and out the other through their tunic. That's their bodies. Um, and they just kind of filter out whatever dead, disgusting, nutrient-rich stuff uh, they happen to find. 
really interesting um, kind of stuff going on. This is, of course, the black rockfish. Uh, they cruise around and they sometimes get as far south as us. Um, I've seen a few off the shores of Vashon. They're a little rarer. Uh, uh, further north in British Columbia, they occur in big aggregations around these big pilings and, um, as I talked about, these big plumos anemone gardens. So, all of those exist in this range. I just wanted to show you some other footage from some uh, nearby places. I'm not gonna show you any underwater penguins. Um, that's a different talk. But I wanted to transition a little bit to some exciting projects uh, that are going on in the underwater world right here at home. Um, I received a great invitation to help work on a project uh, with Sound Action to install the Orca Cam. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe to you it's the famous Orca Cam. Maybe it's the infamous Orca Cam. This is what it looks like, fresh out of the box, uh, when I'm trying just to figure out how it works. And it spent a fairly long time in my half-constructed house, uh, undergoing many different surgeries, many different uh, wire configurations. Um, my dad helped me a fair bit with this, sort of on and off and on and on and on again. Uh, <laughs> but eventually, we had a signal, and the only thing that remained was to sink it. You'll be amazed how hard it is to sink a giant glass dome. You'd think it would just get down there. Want to go down to downtown Seattle where the Amazon domes are and sink them too. Wouldn't that be nice? Maybe the traffic would abate. Turns out you need a heck of a lot of weight to sink even just a small glass dome. Uh, if I try to sink Amazon, then I'm sure they're listening. I probably shouldn't say that. It'll take a lot more than this. So I built this box, bought a bunch of metal, lead ingots, um, and poured it all into a foundation. This thing weighed uh, about 700 pounds when it was all done. And through a huge amount of brute force, um, we took it down to Point Robinson Beach, uh, sunk it underwater after my brother and I had built a platform, bolted it down there. This is me holding it right before it goes in again. Um, and at long last, it started to live feed. And wouldn't you know, um, it actually does work, I promise. This is the stream from it, um, but it's nighttime, so you can't see anything. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Guess I should have thought of that. <laughs> uh, um, if you haven't tuned in uh, yet, do take a look at the live stream from the near shore camera. You can just search for sound action on YouTube. Fascinating things. There's lots of other cool projects uh, going along. Um, my buddy Mike is not happy about me taking a selfie. I think he's rolling his eyes about millennials and their phones. I'm not really sure. Bianca was very happy to pose for a photo. Um, lots of cool things. Mike's building a kelp farm. It's really exciting. That's a huge boon for habitat um, around the island. It's kind of a dead zone in that particular section. Really interesting stuff happening. Um, of course, everything Vashon Nature Center is doing. Um, and the Natural Wonder exhibit at the museum, if you haven't been. Uh, Bianca, is it still going? Yeah? Yes. Great, go see it. Bye, golly. Um, and finally, of course, the styro recycling event and the beach cleanups. You find that Nick is all over this presentation, isn't he? Uh, <laughs> handsome guy. Give it up for Nick. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, always willing to pose for a photo, pose for a cause. Um, I think pollution is probably the number one issue that our world is facing. Of course, um, atmospheric carbon emissions are a form of pollution. I think that's a big, big issue and something we need to address yesterday. However, uh, what we can do is just manage our trash appropriately. Don't put it in where it's going to harm a bunch of stuff. Don't put it on your neighbor's dinner plate, right? If your neighbor happens to be an octopus, knock it off. Don't put your trash there. 
Um, this is an active management thing. Uh, your trash will go there if you don't pay attention. It settles. Things slide downhill. It's on us to do everything in our power to keep that stuff going the right place, reducing our use of it, um, reducing our emissions of it, right? Why? This is a really interesting study um, in 2015, it's a long time ago now, um, that was sort of a back of the napkin calculation about how much plastic goes into the ocean every year. Really rough, um, but it was peer reviewed. And they came up with this cool infographic. So total plastic production, 270 million metric tons. And they just kind of worked backwards from, okay, well, where is the plastic produced? Where does it go? It ends up in these countries that border the ocean. How much of that is mismanaged? How much of it can end up in the ocean? Um, and you sort of reduce these numbers going along, but you still end up in 2015 with 8 million metric tons of trash entering the ocean each year. That is unacceptable. One of the interesting things, um, sort of ghostly foreshadowings of that paper, 2025, which is rapidly approaching, we expect to reach 17 million metric tons. That's unacceptable. And I'm dismayed to admit that the most recent numbers I heard, this is a couple of months old, are we are up to 11. That's unacceptable. What does that look like? Well, if you take six and a half of these plastic grocery bags and you fill them to the brim with plastic trash, and on each, they're about a foot wide, right? And then on each, each foot of coastline in the entire world, you line up six and a half of those on every single foot, and every single year you shove it into the sea. That is 11 million metric tons. Every square foot of coastline. That's unacceptable if it's Vashon alone. We have to do something about this. I'm delighted to announce that on January 15th, we'll be doing another beach cleanup. This is on a bit of a pause the last year. Sorry, that's my fault. Um, but I loved the energy <coughs> Sorry. Uh, that happened last, you know, last couple of times we tried this. I really want it to happen again um, in partnership with Zero Waste Fashion and the Styro Recycling event. We hope to take all the beach trash that you capture and instead of sending it to the landfill where it sits forever, right, we hope to reprocess it and turn it back into something useful. That is where the power really lies. Yes, we need to get it off the beaches. We need to get it out of the ocean. We need to change the reason why it goes in there in the first place. But you can't just pile it high somewhere. We've got to start um, end-of-life, cradle-to-cradle management of pollution, right? Before I let you go, before I turn you loose to think about the horrors that are waiting <laughs> on your drive home, anybody living on Maury, you're going to drive past Tramp Harbor, you're going to know, right? <laughs> if you're driving on Quartermaster Drive, on um, the Inner Harbor, they're watching you too, right? Beautiful, fascinating creatures, mostly totally uninterested in you swimming around up there perfectly happy for you to take a look into their world. Stewardship is the most important thing. Having a dominion over the land perhaps was a mistranslation. And really it's stewardship over the land. It's stewardship over the ocean. I'm gonna be outside over there after we do a little bit of question and answer. But while I have your all's attention, um, I do invite you, if you, any of these images really captured your imagination, your curiosity, um, and you would like to own one of them, you are certainly welcome to. 
Um, some of the bigger prints I have out there, uh, they are for sale. It's a donation. Um, half of it, after the cost of printing it, I'm going to mail them to you directly. Um, so I don't have a ton of them. I just have one of each. Uh, smaller ones you can take home. The bigger ones, um, please just let me know if you'd like one. Uh, have a donation. Uh, half of it's going to go to island organizations, Zero Waste Fashion, Fashion Nature Center. Uh, the other half are going to go to help me pay off my cameras. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and as a final word, be, don't step on the mom rats. Beware the mom rats. And thank you all so much for your attention. <laughs> Done right. Hey, Bianca. <laughs> Thank you, James. That was great. If there are any questions, I have a mic here, and I can run it over to you. So just raise your hand if you have a question for James, and we'll get going here. And as you know, I also have a, submers a little remote submersible. Sure. And uh, I'm wondering, uh, how will I uh, find out where you've gone that uh, I can go explore also. Sure, yeah. Uh, where can you take a little remote submersible? Where can you go exploring underwater around Vashon? Um, if you have the notion, the technique, the ability, the toys, um, or tools to do so, please do. Um, I'm an open book. Any of the dive sites, some of my favorites are the Tramp Harbor oil docks. Fantastic. Um, ecosystem that has colonized those old pilings. Uh, beware the North End Ferry, they get a little testy, uh, but it, <laughs> you'll be okay. Uh, Dalco Wall is boat access only, but it's an incredible place, it's very deep, that's off the south end. Um, I would say find some structure underwater. Uh, KVI is another great place. A bit of a boat access only, but if you go right off the point there, uh, you'll find some marvelous things. There we go. Yeah, I have a question on um, the pictures you said might have been from BC, the the rockfish and the lingcod. Sure. Have you seen those around Vashon? Have I seen uh, the, the rockfish, rockfish and, and the, the lingcod. lingcod around Vashon? Have I seen uh, rockfish? Absolutely. I was part of a rockfish survey a couple of times. A group from California comes up and does surveys up here. I've gone with them a few times. Um, Lingcod, I have not personally seen around Vashon. I, I know that they occur here. Uh, if you want to go take a swing at one, there's uh, reputed a very large and territorial one off of Dilworth. Um, I know a lot of people go swimming out there. Are they deep? Are, are yeah. they deep swimmers? Yeah, they are bottom fish. Uh, they live on the bottom. They are ambush predators. Same kind of thing as um, scorpion fish or... Um, other kind of bottom-dwelling fish. They kind of sit on the bottom, they sit up on their pectoral fins, like a little kickstand, and they just wait for something to come by, and bam, ambush predators, sculpin style. And, and rockfish, too, are also Rockfish, no, are reef, they're a reef fish. Um, so they will be near the bottom, but they have swim bladders. They can go up to the surface if they want. They can come and bite your toes, but they won't. How far out are the big lingcod? Mm, not particularly far. Uh, they can be, they're generally um, found 30 feet or below. So they are definitely a subtitle animal. They're not going to be like right in the shallows. You're not going to accidentally step on one. But uh, they will be, yeah, not particularly deep either. Sure, uh, the biodiversity of Puget Sound versus um, other, other ocean bodies. Yeah, Puget Sound is um, really interesting, beautiful. It was one of Jacques Cousteau's favorite places to dive. Um, this, by the way, that was a different Puget Sound, right? A lot has changed since then. But Puget Sound is really interesting because it's an inland sea. It's brackish. It means their water pH and salinity here um, is different. It's less salty here because of all of the rivers that come in. Like the Skagit is a huge amount of water that enters the Puget Sound and the Puyallup right around us is massive. So it changes the chemistry a little bit. So you will find um, an unusual variety 
an unusual distribution, um, and an unusually high or low abundance of certain animals. It's not as productive anymore as places that have lots of deep, wa uh, deep water uh, upwelling, so to speak. That's very nutrient rich. This is coastal BC in Southeast Alaska. Uh, but here you'll find um, it's very diverse and interesting, but the ratios are the most interesting thing, Grant. Bill. Thanks. Um, I have noticed a little bit more kelp uh, showing up uh, south of Reading Beach, uh, around Dalco a little bit. Um, do you think it's, it's, there's a revival of the kelp, or is it still in the decline? Is there a revival of the kelp? I would say there probably is. Um, stewardship and conservation um, have kind of gone through a bit of a swing. There, um, again, that chemical imbalance, I would say, of Puget Sound, the natural imbalance I would, is a fair bit more um, sensitive, especially for, for giant kelps. Um, it's quite a bit warmer around here than it is just um, on the other side of the Olympic Peninsula or in other regions like that are purely oceanic. Um, we're artificially very warm here. So it's a sensitive ecosystem for kelp. Um, I'd say with, you know, reductions in chemical pollutants, um, that has allowed for more, in general, um, a higher biodiversity to sort of recolonize, regrow. Um, but as for kelp specifically, where's Mike? Can you speak to this? What do you think? So I'm no kelp expert, but I have noticed, as you mentioned, there's a bunch off of the south end near Dalco Point. Um, you know, bull kelp in particular has been dying off a lot in California. It's about to become um, listed on the Endangered Species Act, I believe, in the next couple of years. Um, and there's just a variety of different signals in terms of why that is. Um, so it's something that if you see, it's, it's becoming more and more of a rare thing. And hopefully that turns around as we start doing more good things like James is mentioning. Okay, let's take, oh, we'll take a question from Carlista and then one from the uh, front and then we should probably wrap it up. I'm directing it at the guy down there with the, <clears throat> with the remote. If he will get with Bianca and use her as a go-between three other or four other divers who have access to other spots. Hmm. We would love to have you join us. We have met more divers who say, oh yeah, I dive, uh, but not in cold water. Mm. <laughs> or I only dive such and such, but I'm serious. And both of these other people have, have been buddied up with people who have underwater cameras or scooters. Ooh. But let's make the center point Bianca so we have a, a constant contact. Perfect. And you have another please, job. Uh, <laughs> the Tramp Harbor dock should be referred to as the Tramp Harbor dock, not the Standard Oil dock. There's quite a history to docks hmm. uh, along there. And uh, yeah, I've got a couple to go. But so, <laughs> anyway, I, I <laughs> next, dove, next talk. <laughs> yeah, I dove these areas for 33 years. Oh. And the pictures you're showing of the detritiums, they don't exist on the pilings any, anymore, as you just showed.
Sure. Can you just <coughs> rephrase that? Yeah, you bet. So the, um, the structure that's off the point of KVI um, is, is, I don't believe it's a wreck. Uh, it's an artificial reef that was sunk deliberately. There are like old concrete telephone poles looking things that are kind of all stacked up down there. And that sits at, what well, there used to be a buoy out there. I wasn't there last time I looked. Uh, that drops you down, what is it, Nick, like 30 feet? 30 feet is the shallowest, and then you can go all the way down those pilings all the way to 75 or 80 feet. That's usually about where Nick and I look at each other and say, yeah, it's probably deep enough. Uh, but they do go down a fair bit for, uh, down farther. The giant Pacific, yes, has been known uh, to nest there. I haven't seen one there. Uh, I have some friends who have seen them there. They, um, they live very short lives, so they grow very quickly. And whatever size was estimated from when I last heard about them um, will certainly be incorrect now. They do live there. Lincod live there, too. I uh, have, just haven't seen them. But it's a fascinating, uh, beautiful ecosystem down there. Uh, I hope they put that buoy back so we can actually find it. Anyway, thank you all. All right. Thanks, James. <laughs>